speaker this morning, uh, Cheryl Van Vake. Getting out of spit zone. Or Van Vake. In any case, there's a Dutch background there somewhere. Uh, he's no stranger, of course, to us, and have been with us before. And um, just got a call from him a couple weeks ago, said, hey, uh, you ever said if you're in Pennsylvania again or North America, to let you know. So he did let us know, and we're thrilled to have him back here again this morning. Uh, Charles, of course, is a uh, veteran South African missionary and uh, native to South Africa. And is working there to this day. And very importantly, to us here in America, has seen a, has lived to see a wonderful godly country literally go to the dogs. It's a hard thing to watch. A lot of lessons there for us. Cheryl, thanks for coming. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you very much. I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to be here. It was really short notice uh, telling Joel, remember you said that I'd let you know when I'm in North America again. I'm going to be there in, in a week and a half. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's really great to come here and see the old faces. And I said to Joel, even if there are no meetings, I just want to come say hi to everybody over here because we had such a great time, our fellowship when I was here in April. So, uh, so thank you very much for having me. Jack, my daughter Roberta is traveling with me. I can't see her right now. Uh, really we're, just, yeah, we're just traveling with me, and uh, she's 18, and we're going to Florida, she's hoping to get work there. Um, so if you pray for us for that, we'd really appreciate that. But let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your great kingdom coming here on earth. We pray, Lord, that you will use each one of us for that to happen. We thank you for your great grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can uh, be a part of your work on earth. We praise you for that in Jesus Christ's a wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to give you just a bit of a uh, report back of some of the things we've been doing this year in South Africa and north of South Africa. A uh, quick missions report back. Uh, just another thing that happened when I was over here last time is one of the saints' sons who will remain um, uh, anonymous took me shooting. And I tried to explain to him, I'm not a great shot. He's like, oh, come on, you've written a book on guns. <laughs> Don't tell me you're not a great shot. So he took me shoot, shooting and um, praise the Lord, the rains came down and it packed the guns away. <laughs> so the son of a saint who isn't a saint um, goes to his father and says, you know, Charles said he's a really bad shot before we left to go shooting. And I didn't believe him, but... Boy, he's really bad. <laughs> anyway, so, this is hard anyway. Um, some of the things we get involved with in South Africa is the life chain. Um, we've had abortion legalized only for, uh, since 1998 in South Africa. And so, uh, we've had over a million babies that have been aborted during that time, that have been murdered. And so, we take a stand on this and what we call the life chain. So there's my son in the bottom right, and my daughter in the top uh, right-hand corner, my pastor um, of the church that we had as our sending church in South Africa with me, and uh, he's, all, he's all adopted daughter. Um, and we've taken part in the, the life chain in Cape Town, South Africa. So a group of people afterwards, um, and uh, we use this as an opportunity for gospel outreach too, so leaflets and tracts are handed out the traffic lights, in the main city center, a big tourist area. You can see hotels in the background. Um, so it's very much of a first world area that we're in over there. And try to take the, the gospel out to the passers by as they come along. Also do some school leadership training. We call them prefects, very British uh, way of saying things. They're school leaders, young people that uh, help the teachers run the school. And so we do some leadership training. I call it servitude training. So. Uh, the, the politically correct word is leadership, because everybody wants to be a leader, we just don't have any followers. But uh, the idea is servitude, we need to serve the people and therefore we'll lead through our, our serving. Stone Hill, this is part of the third world area of South Africa that we work in. In Afrikaans it's called Klipiabal, that's a, the real name of the area that we're working in. It's a shanty town, we call it a township. Um, if somebody in South Africa talks about a township, they're talking about a shanty town. This little house is made out of metal. And so here's a missionary from America, bottom right, uh, speaking to the children there. We're hoping that you guys will send some missionaries out to join us there on shorter missions. And on the bottom left, my brother-in-law, um, 
Bradley, who's leading for the children there too. Uh, this is part of the, the work we do, is help people with their shacks that are completely messed up and ruined. That, that's a house that somebody lives in, that's not a shed. It's not, a, it's not your shed that you find on a farm. This is uh, in the township. You can see other little shacks around there. And somebody actually lives in that. And sometimes you'll find four to six people in one, uh, maybe twice the size of that one. And so that one was completely wrecked, and so we helped put up a new one. And there the people's new little metal shack is um, with our ministry men that get together and help. Now, lots of the people in the community also help with this themselves. So we, we try and raise the funds to. Uh, go out and, and help these people, um, and we don't go help able-bodied men that can do the job themselves. We try to help those who are widows, those who lost their husbands, husbands that have uh, walked out from the family, uh, there's trauma at home, and so uh, that's when we all get involved. We have on one occasion, which I mentioned last time, helped somebody who is the local uh, thug in the area, he's the drunkard. We helped him to show God's grace and God's mercy to the community, uh, and the people were really upset with us. Because why must a drunkard in the community who swears and causes havoc be the one to, to get uh, the grace of permission to, to help out? So that was a teaching point uh, on one occasion. That young man's apparently in church every Sunday morning now. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. This faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Last time I spoke, I showed you a little plan of what we're aiming to do with shipping containers. Well, the three shipping containers are on the ground in our area now. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, this is the truck coming in to uh, deliver those. I sort of read the scripture to us. Luke chapter 9, from the beginning. And he called his, the, his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Notice said he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet, as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So Christ told them to go preach. He didn't say the gospel. He said, go, go preach the kingdom of God. And then later says, they went out and preached the gospel. Aren't we onto something here? Aren't we talking about the same thing? And so that's very much what we are teaching these young people in this area, is we're teaching them about God's kingdom. Um, obviously, personal salvation is a starting point to that, but that's not the be-all and end-all of the gospel. It's not about us. It's about God and His kingdom. And so when I speak to these young people, we're preaching there at the Sunday evening services, we're starting off with, our God reigns, He's the King, He tells us how we worship Him, and it's only through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we can communicate with Him. So therefore, all the ancestors are not very helpful at all, because that's what they do. They worship God through the ancestors. <coughs> um, and so we're going to start laying the foundation about who's in charge, what He's commanded us, we can't keep up with those commands, we fail in every way, and therefore we need a mediator, and that's only Christ, nobody else. So that's the, very much the, the message that we have for the, for the youngsters there. That's our three containers. Well, part of the reason we've got the containers is because we can do what we've just read in Scripture now, is if they don't accept the Word of God, and it's really hard soil, and there's endless trouble, and I'll show you later the kind of trouble that happens there, we pick up our containers and we leave. The other thing too is very difficult to break these. If you put brick houses up or brick buildings, they can, they'll take down every brick. They can steal the bricks and they can use it for their own little shacks and things. And uh, so it's very difficult to do with this. Uh, the, no, not yet? Thanks. Um, bottom left, they're busy starting our flooring over there. And at the top you can see there was no floor. We put in a floor now. That's the floor for our church that meets on a Sunday evening in the area. And uh, so we're very excited to have that. On the far right, the container, the shipping container on the far right is a gymnasium with weights. The guys are pumping weights there. And that's been really great because the older guys in the community who will completely reject the gospel just outright because the elders in the community say that the church is only for women and children are now hanging out by us, which is very uh, cool. Um, 
in Africa to have older black guys hanging around. And so they're hearing the gospel with her while they're with us. They're seeing what's going on. And so now they're popping on the Sunday evening to see what's, what's happening when the gospel is preached for everybody there. So really wonderful to see that. The middle um, container is our two classrooms. You can see two doors there. It opens up into two classrooms. We're very excited about that. Lots of the kids in their 20s don't even have school finishing certificates. We're going to get started with that very soon. Uh, Lord willing, we'll open up a school 2017. So um, we really appreciate your prayers for that. And then on the far left is our kitchen to feed the, the people in the community. Let's carry on. We also have uh, Bibles that we hand out to the children. And the bottom right hand picture over there is our cool dudes. <laughs> They are the guys that uh, protect us from the Pentecostals and Charismatics taking over our meetings. No, I'm just joking. And one of my friends said the other day, these kids love their music. Um, and it's blaring music. The speakers have got these lights that you get a discotheque on the speakers. I don't know where we got these speakers from. And uh, so even when the preacher's preaching, the lights are going. You know? <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty interesting. So here we have the, uh, the young men, uh, young girl with her Bible. And it's just amazing to see how these kids are starting from basics to understand the gospel and, and starting to apply it in their lives. Next one. That's some of the children running around there still. We, Lord willing, looking at early next year, putting a roof over our building. So, and then covering up the front so we can have nice uh, warm services there in winter when it comes. And we have a sport ministry going on. Too. One of our young boys has just been... Um, just won the championships for the wrestling and some other word they use, but basically a wrestling sport that we do in South Africa. He's the champion in his area, got the gold medal, and he's been asked to come and fight in America at the World Championships. This is a little 18 year old, and he uh, lives in one of the shacks that we've seen. So very excited to see that where they'll ever get here's another story, but uh, we're very excited to see that. And we don't allow the best fighters to take part. We take those who are dedicated to, uh, to the gospel, who come to the meetings, who listen to what's being taught, and those who come to mess around and to play games and they don't come to all the meetings. doesn't matter how good a fighter they are, they get excluded from the competitions, uh, at least from us. They can't come and uh, represent our ministry and our work at the competitions. So we're very strict on them. It's not a free-for-all. Everybody gets, gets whatever they want. Uh, not at all. Next one. So here's our service on the left, you can see there in the pitch dark, um, it's pretty, pretty cold at night too there, so open air services, because you want, uh, if it's really cold and it's raining, we try and force everybody into the two classrooms, and that's just chaos, uh, it's absolute chaos, trying to squeeze in there, you're like a mouse in a reformed church, and um, it gets really tight. And so we've got our camera up on the container there, and it's uh, the words of the music, and my one friend who teaches uh, discipleship, he leaned over to me the other day because they love their music, but they get a favorite song of these kids, and we allow them to run the services. We, we, we either do the teaching and the preaching, but they set up everything. They would sort our tables and cameras, uh, not cameras, the projectors and the lights, and they would get the generator going because there's no electricity, and they set up everything for us. And they'll play, play one song three times because it's their favorite song. And so my one friend leans over to, to me and says, I think we've just become Pentecostal. <laughs> we've just been singing the same song over and over and over. Anyway, so the young boy there on the bottom right, Mabuti, he was a head of a household at the age of 12. So really tough. One wonders how these kids ever uh, eat. He had to look after his brother at the age. They had their little shack that they lived in. And now he's one of our leaders in the group. He's been sent on a frontline fellowship training course with Dr. Peter Hammond. He's been sent up to Namibia, just north of us, for discipleship training. And Lord willing, we hope that he in the future will be uh, the pastor of the church that we're busy establishing. Thank you. Uh, church of the small sea. This is uh, some of the guys getting ready before it's got dark. Uh, people coming along for the service, the outdoor service that will be happening. Next photograph. So there we are meeting at night and it's got dark with our uh, cameras and the singing on the uh, words are on the, sh on the container over there. Afterwards we, uh, we feed the children. Uh, lots of them get, the only meal they'll get will be one meal a day at the government school. So during the holidays we feed them because Many of them won't have a single meal uh, in three weeks, uh, so they're scruffling around in bins and what have you. So we feed them, and then on the weekends too, uh, many of the parents are drunk out of their minds, especially at the end of the month. 
and we'll have these drunkards coming in making noise at the service. We'll just grab them by the arm, pull them behind one of the containers and lay hands on them. I mean, you, you just <laughs> tell them to leave. They make a noise there. Yeah. And so we feed them uh, after the service and so many of them come, um, many of them might even come just because of that. They're going to hear the word of God, uh, the true bread of life being preached. This is why we've got to, we've got to be careful of having brick and wooden buildings, is because of the uh, political violence in the area. So here they are uh, very upset because they don't have electricity in the area. Well, the reason they don't have electricity is because the land they're on is private land. And the government can't put in electricity and roads on private land because the government doesn't own the land that they're on. <laughs> so it becomes very complicated. So they're all actually illegal squatters. And uh, so these are the kind of people that we're dealing with. But the funniest is, I'll be talking to one of them and we'll be chatting and I'll say, Ah, oh, I saw you on the photographs in the press, you were throwing stones at the police. And they'll go, No, it wasn't me, it was Johnny! And they'll point to somebody else. <laughs> so they blame each other for being involved in this. But, but many of them would be involved in this and then come to church on Sunday. I'm talking about those who aren't Christians. Um, and, and we don't know who's who in the zoo, you know, because we're not throwing stones at the police. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, very interesting, very interesting to see the way they think and the way they work. And the, the idea is that government won't listen to you unless you are involved in violence. And that's the way they've been brought up, is uh, you don't obey any laws, you know, you're law to yourself, you can do whatever you want, and government won't listen to you unless you cause havoc. And uh, that's the thinking. Then we're off to Zimbabwe with Pastor Penny, a friend of mine. He's an elderly pastor, he earns less than $5 a week, he oversees eight churches, uh, he travels by bus around, and as one of my friends said, isn't it amazing how messed up this culture is? That even amongst the Christians, he can't, he can't feed his family, his children had to leave school because they didn't have money for schooling, so they're uneducated children at home. He oversees eight churches. When he dies, they will buy cattle to slaughter, and they will rent buses. The churches will get together to rent buses, to bus everybody to the funeral. Now that's the leftovers of their messed up pagan ideas and, and uh, ideology and philosophy. You know, the, the, the dead, uh, because they are the ancestors and they, they go between, between you and God, are revered. So you can suffer and die and your kids can be un, uh, uneducated and you can have, you know, obviously eight churches on five dollars a week. Uh, nobody cares. They won't bother to feed you because they're all struggling to put food on their own tables. But once you're dead, then all the excitement happens. Then the circus starts. So th that's what happens here. And so we try to help uh, Pastor Penny, my friend in the red over there, is Cosmo. He's a local Zimbabwean. He works with us in South Africa too. He's worked around the world. He's been trained up our operation mobilization in um, what they call community uh, development. So he's very jacked up on these things. Let's carry on. And so I was speaking to Intersmission International's uh, director, Steve Evers, we're telling him about this project that we want to get started to help <coughs> the pastor and his family uh, breeding rabbits and chickens for them. And Steve uh, said, well, how much is that going to cost? I told him, he pulled out about 70% of the money and gave it to me straight across the table and said, get on with the job. So by God's grace, Cosmo went straight up to the pastor, started digging holes there, carry on. And he built the chicken coop, which is on the bottom left, the bottom right is a rabbit hatch. The reason the rabbits are up in the air is because the wolves and the jackals uh, love to eat them. So that's why they're up in the air and also so that the rabbits don't pick up diseases from the ground which they are susceptible to. Um, the chicken coop is the one, the brick one on the side and there's been a major um, heat wave in the area. There's drought in the area at the moment. And Cosmo said he came in to see what was going on with the little chicks, and he saw the pastor's wife, and she's standing crying, speaking to the chickens, saying, the heat will pass, the heat will pass. Oh, it's just amazing. She's like really babying these chickens. I doubt they're ever going to get to eat the things, but anyway, they can sell them off and help support the family. Carry on. That's uh, what a rabbit looks like after it's been what we call fried, prepared on the barbecue. That's a barbecued rabbit, uh, ready to eat. This one died. They didn't kill it, it died from the heat. Uh, but the idea is that they're breeding the rabbits to be able to sell to the community to eat because the people eat rabbits part of their staple diet there. Uh, this is the area where Cecil the lion got shot that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You don't know about Cecil? Oh, you do. Okay. 
Um, this is the area there, and um, so that's going to be the food for their people, and that's as well. They're going to get money for their family, Lord willing, uh, be able to do greater and more ministry in the area. Next one. This is Pastor William in Zambia. Uh, his only transport he has, besides taking taxis, is uh, this bicycle that he bought him, so he can swiftly ride around to people, to pray for the sick, and to witness to various people in the area. These guys are absolute giants in the faith. They don't know the arguments and the debates on, on homosexuality, or on pornography, or on abortion. To them, it's wrong for one reason, because God's word says so. There is no debate. And so there is no discussion on these things. It's just a matter of God's word says it, and so that's the way it is. Um, and they will take on orphans into their homes and look after them. And the churches, which we're going to show you now, just carry on, please. Um, the churches and that, that they build there, you might think, oh, what a waste of church uh, uh, building. Why do they need a building? Well, because they're meeting outside under the tree. That's why they need a building. Um, and, the, and their building is part of them taking dominion in the area. It's part of showing the community the Christians are organized. They can save. They're hard workers because nobody saves. Everybody's drunk. Um, they're putting up, and then people who don't have homes sleep in these churches. Kids that are on the streets. Um, so this is part of taking over uh, the community for Christ. That's what they do. It's not like, yeah, where you put up a church and you visit uh, two hours a week. Um, it doesn't happen like that in Africa. Everything gets used all the time. And so here we have the crusade. My friend Ron, who is from uh, Washington, D.C. area, is praying over this man who is a chief in the area. And he's come to put his faith in Christ um, at this meeting. Next one. There was a lady that was a witch doctor. We call her Sangoma. She's the better of the bad witch doctors. She helps people. She heals them. Uh, we heard that she had come to the crusade and she wanted to know more about the gospel and she didn't come back the next day, so we went to look for her with Pastor William, uh, the real stalwart. There he is, by the, gone and fetched her out of a hut, a little brass hut, and he's taking her by the arm because she's blind. She was working in the fields one day, something went wrong with her eyes, I don't know if dirt got into her or what, but she's blind, permanently now. So he brings her over for us to sit under a tree to talk about the gospel. And so you'll be chatting to her, my friend Ron and I, and Pastor William, and we're telling her about the gospel, and she's got this very concerned look on her face, she's really worried. Her husband comes along. He is so excited about the gospel, he's listening to it. He runs off to fetch her tools of trade, the bones and things that she uses for when she communicates with the dead and the ancestors and that sort of thing. He brings it and he puts it down in front of us. Next, next one. And he pulls out one of the items and he says, this is what my wife uses this item for. It's a little, a little uh, thing that you can see there, a wooden thing, and it's got a bit of a, um, uh, it's like a cone. So when somebody is ill and sick, they come to the Sangoma, the wife, because she has special powers from God and through the ancestors, and it's all demonic, and they come to her and then she cuts them, she slits their arm open <coughs> so that blood comes out. And then she puts the cone on the blood, over the bladded area, and she sucks the blood into her mouth through this vacuum uh, in the cone. Then she decides how she needs to help them. So that's, that's her life. That's how she makes her money. That is how she provides for the families by being a Sangoma. Next picture. So then he's showing us putting it on the arm. This is what it looks like. And then he showed us you, you suck through that uh, contraption and suck the blood into your mouth. So. She decides she's going to put a faith in Christ. So we say, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to go burn all your tools. Because it's over and done with. And that happens so often in Africa, the true gospel and the full gospel doesn't get told to the people. And so they'll carry on going to the Sangoma. They'll be in church on Sunday morning with their child sick. They'll be at the Sangoma, the witch doctor, in the evening with the child. And so we say, no, everything has to be destroyed. Our God's a jealous God. There, is, there aren't any other gods. Uh, demons can all go to hell, back to hell. And you need to put your faith completely in God to provide for you too. And so we go and we burnt the tools. Her husband was so excited about this, he ran along and he lit the fire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was just completely taken up with the gospel. It was like mind blowing for him. And uh, so he started the fire and he took his wife's stuff. She's lying, she can't see anything. So he, he dumped the stuff in the fire. And we stood there praying while it went to smithereens. And uh, the woman's whole demeanor just completely changed from being this very concerned and very uh, sour-looking face all the time 
to like just completely relaxing, like it's all over. Um, so very excited to see. Now this is Pastor Williams' uh, ministry. He's now going to look after this woman. She comes to church now and again. Obviously she's very old and she's frail and she's blind. But when she can get to church, she comes to his church and uh, comes to, uh, to worship with the saints. And we left some funds there for him to help her so that we can establish you know, some fields and that. So they've got fields already but to uh, grow their fields and to help uh, put money on the table for her in a new farm fair. Next. So here's the, the church building that they're putting up. As I said, this is part of their taking dominion of the area. Um, in the same context in America, it might not mean that, but this is them with the gospel being practical, uh, getting out there, making a difference. And uh, through a lot of stories which I won't go into now, they really struggled. They got the land onto their name. And they put the building up to roof height, and they just, it's just completely depleted the whole congregation. They've got no more money to carry on. So the pastor asked me if we could help, and um, I put it out in my newsletter about God's grace. They're not just getting the roof they asked for, they're getting doors and windows too. And uh, very, very excited about that. And when we're talking about doors and windows, don't think American style. We're talking about pieces of metal put onto some wooden frames. There's no, whatever you call these things, um, ceilings, there's no electricity, there's no ablutions. So we'd love to help them with all those things, but at the moment they're going to get uh, windows, they're going to get doors, and they're going to get a roof over them. So praise the Lord for that. Very, very exciting to see. And so thank you. You guys have uh, supported us uh, through your elders, and thank you very much for us here last time. You gave us uh, very nice financial support. And because of that, you might want to ask some questions about what you do with your fans. But uh, either way, if there are any questions, please ask me. It's always the best part of uh, the talk. It's not my boring talking, but uh, the questions that are asked. So, is there anything going on in your mind? Please shout. Thank you. Yes. The um, church being built with brick, is that anything um, negative as far as would they come and take the bricks off? Oh, no, not in this area. This is outside of South Africa, and it's. Um, the people are not uh, forced into a township style where they're living in a shanty town. They're living uh, very much in the old-fashioned way in grass houses, grass huts. And so uh, brick building like this to them is really they're stepping up in the community. And that's a big question that missionaries have struggled with for a very long time, for 100 years in Africa. Is do you live like the people you are ministering to? Or do you set up your, standard, you set your standards higher? So that they can see that they can come out of the dirt that they're in and actually build something constructive and you know get somewhere in life and work hard and be productive and that sort of thing. So it's been a big question. We, we prefer to go the route where we set the standard higher for them and not accept their useless standards. I mean, people that worship their ancestors, they cannot they cannot produce anything. They're like communists. They can only break, they can only destroy, they can only wreck, they can only pull to pieces. That's why Africa looks the way it does. They cannot produce anything. So the Westerners come in, they put up buildings. We can't even maintain the buildings. That's how useless we are. Uh, completely unproductive. And, and they really, they have this death wish in their philosophy and their ideas of life. Uh, to, to give you one idea, if you saw two farms in Zululand, and the one is owned by a Christian and the other one by, and this literally is true, and a pagan, those who are worshipping the ancestors, uh, You'll see that the farm of the Christian is beautiful, uh, lovely, lovely fields, growing lovely and uh, absolutely <coughs> excellent. And the guy next door's fields will be wrecked. He'll ruin his own crop because if he has a great crop, the ancestors might get upset with them and cause disease and, and uh, cause trouble in the family for him. So really, got that kind of mindset. No wonder Africa looks the way it does. Um, and then people come and blame, obviously, the Western missionaries who came with the gospel for destroying this wonderful culture of Africa. It's a death wish. It's an absolutely destructive culture. Um, anyway, that's the way that's the way it is. We very weird, strange things happen right. over there. Uh, we've been attacked reform people, yes. Missionaries like us get attacked by demons and that sort of thing. We've got to deal with those sorts of issues. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of pandemonium that goes on. Yes sir. The uh, the picture of the <coughs> abortion uh, where you had the signs and yes. What kind of response does that bring, both from the abortion provider and from the civil magistrate? Yeah, very interesting. Um, in the beginning, the civil magistrate was very concerned about it, so we'd have police and that all around there when, we, when we'd come, but now, years later, they don't even bother sending the police anymore. We have to, um, 
Uh, Peter Hammond says we don't ask for permission, we just tell them we're doing it. But that is a, a form you've got to fill in to let them know so that if there's trouble, they can send out um, your traffic officials and uh, policemen and that in case of trouble. Generally, we have a really great reception because there are a lot of Muslims in Cape Town and they love our pro-life demonstration. We even had a, a Muslim cleric once arrive for the, to join us. <laughs> Just once ever, never came back again. But um, because we pushed him into the road as the cars went past. No, no. <laughs> um, we, um, we love uh, having them come past us. They all hoot and thumbs up and they're so excited to see us. And then lots of people uh, give us thumbs up and then you've got those who roll down the windows and swear to you and curse and spit them. Show your thumbs down and all these sorts of things. So it's very varied. Yeah, the government's just putting up with us now. Um, so that's, it's very nice to see the great response we have. Yes, sir. I think on that same photo it mentioned necklace sign. Yeah. Yes. Is that still being practiced? That's, that's still happening. Um, Necklacing is when they take the tire of a car and they put it over a person <coughs> and then they throw the petrol on them, um, gas, gasoline. They throw gasoline on the person and they set them on fire. And then the person burns like a human torch, and the rubber burns into the skin of the people. Now, that was being Nelson Mandela's wife, or Winnie Mandela. She was a lady that was very involved in that in South Africa. It was to traumatize the black people to join the revolution that Nelson Mandela was running. And uh, so they would force them by necklacing people to say, You don't put a foot out of line because you'll be necklaced. So everybody would just tell, do what they're told. So they get to a stage where they didn't even need to do the necklace anymore, they just walked in the township with the matches, a box of matches, and they'd shake it and say, come everybody, we're going out to first phones with the police or do whatever you want to do. And everybody will drop everything they're doing and go do what they're told, just by shaking the box of matches. So that's, uh, that's the necklacing. That is now being used in South Africa by the local population to necklace foreign blacks that are coming into South Africa. There are lots of foreigners coming as refugees from wars in that north of us, so they come to South Africa for refuge, and our blacks are murdering them because they're saying these other blacks, uh, the cockroaches, are stealing our jobs from us. So that's part of the communist indoctrination. You can't grow an economy, it only has, it's static, it only has a certain amount of jobs, and anybody that comes into my country is coming to steal my jobs. That's the thinking of the people. And so, and this is all part of our discipleship and training and speaking about biblical economics and that you can grow a nation's economy through hard work and through labor and you've got to give and tithe and all these things uh, which you just take for granted. It's totally foreign to the black mindset. And with communism being uh, the main philosophy that the government's pushing all the time, it just makes it ten times worse. So they now necklacing people. A couple of weeks ago, near where I live, 12 Zimbabweans were murdered in two weeks. Uh, they weren't necklaced, but they were knocked over by cars, suspiciously, stabbed as they were walking down the road, that sort of thing. And uh, Cosmo was involved with one of the families to send the corpse back to Zimbabwe. And when he got to the airport to send it, a whole bunch of South African blacks were, were there, chanting and shouting at them and uh, causing havoc at the airport. So it's not like they actually, you know, help with uh, you know, giving money to send the corpse back or anything. It's, it's really traumatic for black foreigners to be living in South Africa. Very un unhelpful society that they're living in. Yes? Uh, do you have ever had anybody from the States or anywhere else uh, come over and serve alongside of you? Yes, the question is do we have people from the States coming? Very good question, thank you. Um, do we have people from the States coming and serving alongside us? Yes, we do. Um, and we love it. It's very, very exciting to see. Uh, we are not into... We put people to work. We, uh, we love having children, we love having adults be prepared to clean the toilets and not speak to anybody about Christ because you're going to cause havoc and uh, damage all the work we've been doing. So if you want to serve, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if I take a team into Zambia, uh, I tell them exactly the same thing. These are South Africans who understand black culture. I'll say to them, when you go to Zambia, it's different. You don't speak to people about the gospel. That's what the leaders will be doing. You serving the leaders. And so you clean the toilets, you work in the garden. You, do what, you paint the house, you do whatever you need to do there, but you're not there to give the gospel to the people, because they just ruin things. Uh, just as one example, I was telling Joel last night, um, I've got friends here in America, whose children go over $5,000 a pot for two weeks to um, Africa to play with orphans. And then I see these photographs on Facebook, and all the girls have got these little high shorts on that are right up to their behinds. And they're in a culture where that's completely unacceptable. If you show your thighs in Zambia, that's pornography. 
That's like people having the breasts open here in America. Those girls could have had their, their tops off and nobody would have blinked an eyelid because that's the culture there. But if they're showing their thighs, which is the worst thing they could possibly do going into that area. And I ask these kids, while you're at college and you're preparing to go to Zambia, I'm really interested in the books you read on the cultural differences so that you could go prepare. I don't even read any books. So they're going over there, it was absolute havoc in two weeks. By, and then the, the pagan blacks rip off the Christians about these absolutely low-class, scummy whites that come there with the men of the uh, uh, boys that look like girls with their long hair and earrings in their ears, and people got tattoos on their body, and the girls have got mini skirts on uh, in the townships with their thighs showing. I mean, it just cause absolute that one. So be very strict. It's none of that kind of nonsense. You know, you do it our way or you leave. And uh, leave, when I was with Frontline Fellowship too, guys that weren't fitting the ball, get take them to the airport, drop them off, and say, cheers, get out of here. Um, and that's just when people have got a bad attitude. You know, it's like, we're not going to change, we won't cut our hair, you know, we won't do what needs to be done, well, then you are. Um, and that's not, it's not trying to be funny, it's sort of the damage that gets done, and it's so horrific when you've been working for years with people, um, and then, you know, you've got some cultish ideas coming in, which is just completely unacceptable. And we're not trying to say that, you know, you go, you, it's, it's really funny, because some of the churches in the areas, they have their ideas. Like in, um, in the area we work in, there's one church, you, can't, you can only join the church if you've got hair on your head as a man. No, if you don't have hair on your head, you've got to shave your head to join the church. And so they make all these little rules and things up, you know, and that's, they come to us now, you're in the true gospel, but this is the baggage they come with, all these sorts of weird ideas. And so, when you're working amongst people like that, you've got to understand what you're dealing with, you know, and, uh, and take it from there. It's, in those areas where you're working in the third world areas, do white people live there or is it only black people? Like um, in this specific area, we, uh, we differentiate between coloreds and blacks. Um, they, uh, they're different. The coloreds are a community that were um, born from white Dutch settlers and bushmen uh, in the Cape area. And there's the blacks who are from Central Africa who came down to the south in the 1600s. So we differentiate with them. So you'll get coloreds, blacks and whites all living pretty close to each other. So in this culture that we in is very black. But if you just go uh, 200 yards to the one side, you'll have what we call formal housing, where the coloreds live. And they think they up and above the black people. So when the floods in the area, the colored church wouldn't allow black people in their church to get out of the rain and the floods when their beds and everything are underwater because they, you know, how can they be Christians and stay in the church? Um, and then, so it's this kind of havoc that goes on. So I've met two, two white people living in this area, in Shanks. And yeah, but it's not, you know, it's majority black. If you go to the other areas, you'll be the majority colored. Um, with a couple of, you know, people from various races. And, and is, it, is it racist over there? Like, do you... It's very racist. When you come here, are you like, is, it, is this country racist at all to you? Or no, not at all. Yeah. No, not at all. We're very racist where yeah. we come from. So, as I've just mentioned, you know, the, the coloreds who own the church building won't allow the blacks in there, and it's, and their houses are flooded. Right. And it's because they're black. You know? um, and that's just the way it is. And so we've got to break down these barriers all, all the time. And it's very strange for them to have white people like us coming in and just being part of their community, helping them out and setting up systems. And, uh, but we're not into this thing where, um, you know, this is mine. Uh, I went to a lecture by a missionary from America in South Africa a few weeks ago. It was all like, I've done this and I've done that and I've got these buildings and I've put up that building. There's none of that with us. You know, we put these things up, it's community control. They get the keys for it, they look after it, they run it. We heard the other day that the, the coloreds are going to come and steal our gym stuff. So the next thing they end with welders, they end up welding the doors closed. <laughs> so it's this kind of thing. But the, I mean, as horrible as it sounds, to us we were happy that they've taken um, ownership. And they've realized these are our things, you know. Uh, the leaders have given us the ownership, it's our keys, we've got to look after it and therefore nobody else can steal it. Whereas if they didn't take ownership, they would have said, ah, when this gets stolen, that's okay, the whites will buy us new ones. No, we won't. <laughs> you look after it, or you can go save up your own money and you can buy your own ones. You know, we're only going to give it once. So that's very much the idea. Good. Well, thanks again. It's uh, quarter to 12. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great chatting to you. I really appreciate your, your, um, your elders and your uh, congregation. You made us, make us feel so welcome when we are. Quickly stand up, I told him you were here and you, you weren't here. <laughs> this is uh, Roberta, my 18-year-old daughter, who's traveling with me. So um, she's going to be looking for the job in 
uh, Florida. We aim to go down there tomorrow. So appreciate your prayers for us. Great. Have a seat. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this congregation. It takes your word so seriously. We thank you, Lord, for your, your gospel and kingdom message uh, that you've given us to take to the nations. And as difficult as it is, Lord, and, and the, the trouble that we cause in various areas and the, the political upheaval, we just thank you for your protection, your safety, Lord. And, and even uh, when these things uh, do happen that we don't like, we pray that we're strong in our faith because of, of you've given it to us. We praise and worship and honor you this morning, Lord. We pray for our, your, your grace and blessing to rest upon this congregation. And may it grow, Lord, as they hear the true word being taught. We pray, Lord, that in everything you'll be worshipped and glorified through our lives. We pray this in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.